In the future economy, we can expect many more changes. We will have to really prepare ourselves well. Confidence, the resolve to do our best, the drive to learn new things, and the values that will allow us to succeed all these years. That's how we can write the changes of the future. Minister, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Given the slower economic growth and technological disruption, there will be difficult times ahead for us all. What are your views on the challenges facing us? Well, I think the pace of change that is happening around the world is affecting everyone. Global growth is slowing. But at the same time, there are also different industries that are doing well. Some are growing faster than others. And what it means is that it's opening up a lot of new challenges as well as new opportunities. It is important for us to see how we can prepare ourselves for these changes. What it means for us as individuals is to stay open, keep learning and to have that spirit to try new things, explore and, and to innovate. And for enterprises to understand it's no longer business as usual, they will have to think about how they can better compete and how they can build new and deep capabilities and also to get out of the Singapore market to internationalize. A lot is about how you build in adaptiveness in your strategy, how you build in flexibility, fail fast, move on and try something else. There are a lot of little parts that you have to put together. It starts with the people, education, and how do you make sure that people have the right skills and the right mindset? How do you get people to embrace the whole digital economy, to make digital transformation happen in Singapore? Singaporeans need to be able to embrace technology in their daily lives. Everyone needs to play a part. Just as in a company, the staff comes together. Similarly, if we want impact for the whole economy, then all of us, businesses, as unions, as workers, as government, need to come together to make that big change happen. Anthony, your company is a technological disruptor in its own right it's also facing tremendous competition. So how do you make sure you stay ahead of that competition? It needs to start from yourself. We've got to stop thinking, hey, let's wait and see. That type of attitude, got to take it and then flush it down the toilet. You need to be hungry or learn and want to change. Before you start pointing at anybody else or your company or your country, point yourself first. Our biggest competitive advantage is that we have a group of people who are so hungry to make history. They say, hey, I'm tired of hearing the Googles, the Facebooks of the world. I'm tired of hearing the Ali, Tencent of China. How do I change history? We started as a taxi hailing app. Then in six months, we moved to cars. In another six months, we had bikes. We constantly find lower pricing points to disrupt our previous business. Now we have Share, which puts more people in every car to disrupt the earlier businesses. We started introducing payments to disrupt and make the entire chain completely seamless. Constantly reinventing. I think it's no longer like the past where you just have a long-term goal, a marathon to look at. It's no longer a sprint either that you just have to address the short-term goals and take advantage of the low-hanging fruit, so to speak. It's unfortunately become a sprinting marathon, like it or not, right? You just have to keep on it, on the bleeding edge of technology, of innovation, so on and so forth. So for ourselves at Razor, I think what we've done is we've really focused on um, what we're good at. As Minister mentioned, it's looking at as a team. You can only be the best that you are, looking at finding the best talent, growing that talent, and giving them the opportunities, the funding, the empowerment to take it to the next level. With Razor, we looked at the global market as a whole right from the outset. It wasn't the 5.5 million people over here. We went out there with no preconceived notions that the Valley is going to be any better than us, Shenzhen is going to be any better than us in developing hardware or developing software. A third of our business today is in North America, a third of it is in Europe, a third of it is in Asia, 
and less than 1% is in Singapore. But a third of my staff strength, about three or 400 people in Singapore, focused on making the very best products for the world. That's what we do. Is the Singapore market too small? The Singapore market is too small. Fundamentally so. I've heard many people saying, we're going to test bed it over here, then take it out of Singapore. But while it's a very attractive proposition, bear in mind the rest of the world isn't going to stand still as we test bed things over here. By the time you're done testing it in Singapore, somebody's testing the same in China. Someone's testing the same in California and reaching North America, so on and so forth. So we have to be able to be incredibly nimble take advantage of some of the best talent which can be found over here, but ensure that you're always looking global at any point of time. I think it's interesting that both of your examples are not about just a market in Singapore. It's about how we stay open and connected to the rest of the world, whether it is global sales and distribution, you know, or Southeast Asian sales and distribution with potential to go further. So we have to look outwards we have to build capability for that and we have to assemble people so that they can do this and do this really well. I think we need to realise that you're not competing against fellow Singaporeans, you're competing against global players who are globally mm -hmm. hungry. And to them, they all think like Min and I and they think the world is our marketplace. I think what is really important is this whole notion of creativity. Innovation comes from creativity. The imagination that comes from people who are involved in creating something translates into opportunities in the new world. Well, I've often heard is that Singaporeans can't be creative, oh. right? I mean, that's a, <laughs> something that has been banded around uh, many times. But I, I would definitely defer on that. We are known to be one of the top tech companies in the world. We win the Best of CES, which is the biggest mm -hmm. tech award on the planet, right? And many of the designs that have won Best of CES have come from all the engineers over here in Singapore. I don't necessarily think that creativity is reserved for the domain of the people out in the valley or in China. We have some truly great talent over here. It's really having the right platforms, the right enterprises, and the, the companies to be able to bring it out yes. to a much broader audience. Minister, the Committee on the Future Economy calls for all of us to be future ready. Mm -hmm. How can each of us respond to this call? If we take ownership for our own learning, we stay relevant. But at the same time, it's also how we work together as a team. And in particular, how enterprises put the team together is going to be critical. Being able to assemble some of the best people, being able to give the best opportunities to learn, to contribute, and to make full use of the skills that they have. That will make a difference between whether the company succeeds or not. Giving opportunities, that's something that the government of Singapore has done a great job at. When I first started out, we were looking for funding. We went around Singapore, we approached a group. They said, look, you're a lawyer. You're not going to be able to do anything in tech. Absolutely, no. We've had to find ways to get around funding. Today, we continue to do that. It's about being able to pivot very quickly at any point of time. And unfortunately, this isn't something that we're going to be able to get out of school. But I think there's a fundamental premise over here that is highly flexible, adaptable, and opportunities are availed to everyone else out there. And it's, it's massive right now. You switched track from being a lawyer to being an entrepreneur. Maybe you can share your experience of why you made that leap. Uh, I'm quintessentially Singaporean. I was born, bred, educated here in Singapore, went to NUS Law over here. I practiced for two years after that. But I've always been a gamer and I've always been intensely so. Despite whatever my parents said and despite whatever society as a whole said, it's always been a passion for me. And that's what we decided to do. We found a couple of like-minded gamers together and it's an international world. There was um, my friend Robert uh, in the US and we said, look, we want to create something truly phenomenal, a groundbreaking product that has grown to be a relatively large brand worldwide. And that's what we've done. 
in hindsight, it was a little harder than I expected, but you know, it's still fun and we continue to do that. And therein lies you know, the whole fun aspect of it. You know, what is life if not to be a bit of a game, right? <laughs> Min said it perfectly, right? Obviously, he had many options, but he just wanted to do something that he really felt really passionate about. That's something that would get you through the times. Before Grab, we did a startup and it was very small and it didn't take off. It was about the chauffeur space and we just had to accept failure. It's humbling. And then just pick yourself back up and say, let's do it again. Let's try it with a different spin to it. So for example, if you take Grab, it was about safety. And it's not just in Malaysia, it's in Thailand, it's in Indonesia, it's in many countries. So we ask ourselves, hey, is this a problem we care about? I think my humble suggestion to anyone who's listening to this is focus on something you love, something you care about. Stop saying, oh, this is a problem. Oh, yeah, why the government not fixing? You know, oh, yeah, blame somebody else. Why don't you just say, look, this is a great opportunity and I'm going to solve it first. I'm going to get groups of people that care just as much as I do. I really love two things in what you said. One is passion and the sense of purpose. These two are really important. My concern, Minister, is there are many companies out there who do not understand the need to invest in building skills. Same for technology adoption. There are many companies that are growing very fast. Productivity is going very high because they are at the forefront of technology. But there are also a lot who don't actually adopt any of this, right? So how do you change that mindset and make this whole thing a lot more broad-based? That is a very fundamental challenge. I think that's a very important point. You'll find that in every industry, in Singapore or in any part of the world, the difference in productivity between the frontier firms and the laggards is huge. And interestingly, it's growing too. One would imagine that the frontier firms would be able to take market share. And that is a problem which every economy is challenged with. There are a number of things we can do. One is through discussions like this, I hope that there is greater awareness of the possibilities. Now, the other is the way that trade associations can bring the businesses in the same industry together to discuss the common challenges, address operations of uh, marketing, of uh, management, discuss opportunities for upgrading, and to look at you know, where the new markets could be. I think there is value in some of the businesses working together to uh, scale new heights. And a good example is in the food industry they decided that they have a common food hub for which they could share the facilities and for which they could also share some of the new technologies. And even in some of the marketing efforts, they gathered together and decided to market themselves overseas, including the e-commerce platform. Singapore Food is now on Tmall. I thought that's a great effort. Years ago, I tried to get Singapore food companies to try and do that. And they say, you think you're mad, you know? We're all competitors. And I say to them, wouldn't it be great if people associate this whole group of good companies as a Singapore company, as a brand, you will be a lot more powerful. And it took many years before people realized that yes, indeed, there's a value in getting to work together. Absolutely. I would probably be a little bit more blunt to say that if the firms or companies do not upgrade or innovate, the market will take care of them. I mean, that's the realities of the world. I mean, your products are recognised internationally. In your view, how can businesses, especially local startups and SMEs, reach out to the global market? Right from the outset, it's a, it's a mindset issue. There's really nothing stopping any company over here to reach out to the global market today. The internet is there, e-commerce, so on and so forth. The avenues are there. We've just acquired Lucasfilm's uh, THX, a company that has some true fundamental technologies in sound is now within the ambit for us to design even better products in audio, in software. And I think it's this constant push ahead, this drive, this hunger, so to speak, that's important. And what's even more important is that we are able to do it with significant origins out of Singapore. You're right. Why it's important is that the startups need to be able to scale up. Absolutely. That's right. And uh, enterprises of different sizes need to be able to grow and do better. And that, I think, requires a number of things. One is that whole environment that they are in. And two, the point about 
the companies themselves having to build very deep capabilities. If you are able to innovate, able to do something special, then I think they have a better chance of being able to do that. I constantly hear this fear of failure in Singapore, this concern about risk. And, you know, this is something I say I would like to thank my parents, hi mum, hi dad, you know, out there. <laughs> they came from a really truly Singaporean perspective, right? They said, look, you're going to go to the local use, you have a choice of being either a doctor or a lawyer, and that's it. So there are four of us, two sisters and a brother. Two of them are doctors, my sister's a lawyer, and I was a lawyer too. But the thing is this, I think my parents are incredibly enlightened. We have that safety net, a little bit like the Singapore government, so to speak, right? <laughs> we provide you those fundamentals, but we want you to do the very best that you can. Take the risks that you want. We are here to support you, moral support, so to speak, right? <laughs> When we are here in Singapore, like it or not, a lot of things are taken care of. And that's something that is not availed to many of the people out there. We already have that, the fundamentals for us to do well. The question is taking risk, going out there a little further afield, and there are different ways to do that. I think uh, Min Liang's earlier point about going out there to understand what is happening in those markets uh, is something which I hope to see many more Singaporeans doing, and we should have more schemes to encourage our students to go abroad and learn about the changes and developments that are happening in all these places. You know, for instance, uh, NUS has a NUS Overseas mm -hmm. College where they send students to the innovation hubs of the world. I think we ought to expand that program, uh, involve all the universities and set up learning centres, some form of an innovation alliance, a global innovation alliance, so that our students from a very early age can get out to the world, interact with people from all over, understand the changes that are taking place and where are the opportunities and the challenges. That will be great for learning. Minister, what can we expect from the budget? Well, first of all, although the budget is an annual statement, Many of the commitments that we make are multi-year commitments. Therefore, we always have to think about what is sustainable, what are the medium-term needs. Even as we address some of the immediate challenges, we need to focus our mind on the medium term. And in that regard, keeping our fiscal position sustainable is a very important consideration. I'm aware that many Singaporeans are concerned about the state of the economy. It could be better, but actually our economy is not doing too badly. There will be some short-term support that we can provide to businesses and workers so that they can write over the rough patch which some of them are, are in. But at the same time, I think we have to take the opportunity to really develop capabilities for the medium to long term. And this means investing in, in skills, building innovative capacity and internationalization. I think we should encourage more Singaporeans to get out there understand the market changes and how we can play a role. At the same time, the budget also takes care of us as a society. It is an opportunity for us to see how we can come together to help those in need and how we can encourage fellow Singaporeans to contribute to the well-being of others. So in that way, we can continue to make Singapore a great place to live, to raise your family, and a great place for business as well as for individuals. Thank you, Minister. In closing, we'd like to hear all of your views on the future economy. To me, the future is not destiny. The future is what you make it. If anything, I think the future economy is about us coming together and deciding what is it that we want to make and collaborating to get it done. We set up our venture fund to be able to fund companies in the Valley in Singapore. We have now a platform that can help really talented Singaporeans get their designs, get their engineering to a much broader market because Overnight, we are able to get really talented engineers' designs on the shelves of Best Buy, Amazon, or Media Saturn, so on and so forth. Yes. It's an ongoing thing. As the Minister had mentioned, it's not just about the early stage startups, but to say, okay, we're going to fund some of these guys, we're going to bring it to mid stage and bring some of them to the late stage and support them, but to make sure that there is this ongoing cycle mm -hmm. where the larger organizations go back to the startups in the earlier days and say, okay, what kind of new innovative stuff can you bring to market? So I'm incredibly excited about what um, I think the future economy holds. The key for us is to really 
want to change first. It always stems back to ourselves. Ask ourselves that one question. Do we want to change bad enough? And if we want to change bad enough, then I'm extremely confident that Singapore will evolve. Because if we don't want to change, Minister, even with all your power and budget, there's only so much you can do. And it stems from us. And from here, what can we do together? And if we use that as our anchor and say, hey, we want to be remembered by building something great, by making and pushing the innovation boundaries, by really getting all the millennials, instead of just thinking about blaming people and saying, hey, I really want to impose change and, and bring people together. I think it's extremely bright. That's good. Thank you. You know, when we consider the issue of what we hope to achieve, it is not just in abstract terms, but really how we improve the lives of people in Singapore and how we can make a contribution to the world. And a lot of this means that when we talk about economic growth, it's not just growth for its own sake, but really how that growth translates into more opportunities for our people, opportunities to develop themselves more fully and making ourselves relevant. I hope that the changes that we are going to embark on will create many good jobs to be able to make full use of the skills that they have on the job and to be able to work with like-minded people, achieve something significant. I hope businesses find Singapore a great place to base their ventures and to be able to serve the region and the world. The possibilities are there, the opportunities are there to succeed. I'm confident. Over these five episodes of Let's Think About It, our panellists have shared many different perspectives and insights into the future economy. The willingness to adapt and innovate will open up new possibilities for our future growth. We know that the journey ahead will not be an easy one. But with collective effort, we can continue to build a city that offers ample opportunities for all Singaporeans. Thank you for watching. Let's think about it. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Thank you. everyone. Thank you.